welcome to Focusing on God's Word with Pastor Everton Jeffers. Focusing on God's Word illuminates the Word of God by explaining the Scriptures and conducting word studies using Scripture to support Scripture in the revelation of His Word. Matthew 11, 15 said, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. As he ministered to us today, here now is Pastor Everton Jeffers. Pleasant good day once again. It is indeed my pleasure to be back with you today. I give God thanks for every opportunity that I get to uh, do this broadcast. I don't know when the time might come when I'm not able to do this. And so every opportunity I get, I want to give God the glory for doing so. Today, I want to speak to you on the subject, who is a blessed man? and the characteristics of a blessed man. Many people consider themselves blessed because of the abundance of things they possess. As a matter of fact, today, what I have discovered is that when somebody say you're blessed, they actually mean that you have an abundance. You have a lot of material possession. I want to say this today, that that is not necessarily true, because if that is the case, then the criminals are more blessed than we are as believers because they have a lot more than we do. If blessings is the material things that a person possess, then it simply means that something is wrong. because. The children of God, in many respects, don't have a lot of material things, even though they are blessed. But sometimes the man in the world who is selling drugs, who is corrupt in many ways, they possess so much and can do so much with what they have. And so are you telling me that that man is more blessed? than a child of God? And the, ups, the answer to that is absolutely not. You see, people tend to misunderstood or mistakenly take prosperity for blessing. But there's a difference between prosperity and blessing. And so what we are going to do today is to actually look at the blessed man, the characteristics of a blessed man. And what I am going to do is to use Psalm 1 verses 1 to 3 to show you the characteristics of a blessed man. And also what I'm going to do is to use Psalm 32 verses 1 and 2 to show you how the blessed man earns his characteristics. Why is he a blessed man? Uh, Psalm 1 verse 1 said, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Verse 2 says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. Verse 3 says, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of rivers of waters that bring it forth its fruit in its season. It leaves also shall not wither, but whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. There ends the characteristics more or less of the blessed man. And so today we're going to break that down. Let us look in details as to what this is all about. Now, in Psalm 32 verses 1 and 2, or verse 1, let's just stay there for now. This is what it says. Blessed is he whose forgiveness of his transgression continually exercise upon him, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord imputed no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. So when we look at 
blessed, what it is saying in Psalm 32 and verse 1 is, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. So the man that is blessed, one, his transgression has been forgiven him and two, his sin is covered. What else do we see from uh, Psalm 32, 1? It says that the Lord does not impute iniquity. And number four, in whose spirit there is no guile. So we see that one, the blessed man, his transgression is forgiven him. His sin is covered. The Lord does not impute his iniquity. And in his spirit, there is no guile. In Psalm 32, and, and notice the base for today is Psalm 1. But in Psalm 32, the forgiveness of God makes it possible to accomplish the righteousness of Psalm 1. Without God's covering, without God's forgiveness of sin, without God not imputing man's iniquity, and without the man being purified, and so in his heart there is no guile, then we cannot get to Psalm 1. But where God begins to forgive sins and to cover sins and not to impute iniquity, then we can go to Psalm 1 and begin at verse 1. Now, when we look at Psalm 1 and verse 1, it says, Blessed is the man. And there are three things that I want to point out there that we're going to focus a little on this morning. It says, Blessed is the man that one who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. This is very important. The blessed man does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. He does not stand in the path of sinners nor does he sit in the seat of the scornful. All of these three things meant something when David wrote them. And today, they still mean something for those of us who are alive today. The blessed man. Blessed carries the idea of happiness or contentment. That blessed there carries the idea of happiness or contentment or happiness with contentment the contentment of the life of a man or woman who is right or straight with God so the blessed man is happy and contented because his or her life is right or straight with God the righteous man will be blessed man and it will be, he will be a happy man because what he has is not external but internal. And so what is happening around him does not necessarily affect his internal happiness and his internal contentment. Because his internal happiness, his internal contentment comes as a result of the God who he knows he serve. It is important for us to note this because a lot of people believe that blessedness is only for those, as I've said before, who have a lot. But I'm going to show you as we go on what this blessedness means. The blessedness can be attained by the poor, the forgotten, and the meaningless, as well as those who are famous. This blessedness can be attained by the poor, the, the forgettable or forgotten, and the meaningless, as well as those who are famous, which means that this blessedness is for all, not for some. This blessedness that Psalm 1 speaks about is for all, not for some. Now, let's focus on those three things that we mentioned before. Let's look at what they actually curtail. What, let's, let's see what they contain. There are three things the blessed man does not do. 
One, he walks not. Two, nor stand. Three, nor sit. The blessed man, man do not do certain things. There is a way that he will not walk, a path that he will not stand in, and a seat that he will not sit in. And this is all of us should be aware of this particular thing that I'm mentioning here. All of us should pay attention to this. That blessed man, there is a walk that he will not walk, a path that he will not stand in, and a seat that he will not sit in. We all should be repeating that because it's important for us to know as believers, this is pertinent to our Christian walk. The righteous man and the ungodly man are different in how they think, how they behave, and to whom they belong. Let me repeat it again. The righteous man and the ungodly man, they are different in how they think, how they behave, and to whom they belong. First, the righteous man know how to discern the counsel of the ungodly. The righteous man knows how to discern the counsel of the, the ungodly or the unrighteous. Now, many believers fail at this point. And I'm going to tell you why many believers fail at this point. And this is why David says, the blessed man does not take counsel from the ungodly. And many believers have many unbelievers as their best friend. You need to begin to inquire and begin to take a serious look at that. Because if we are going to live godly, we need to surround ourselves with godly people. We need to read godly stuff. We need to watch godly stuff. And if our best friends and the best thing that we watch are ungodly, how could we not take counsel from the ungodly? And so many believers fail at this point. They do not even consider the counsel that sometimes their unbelieving friend give to them, whether it's godly or ungodly. All they simply do, the counsel is given. And counsel, they simply mean advice. Many believers do not think about advice that they receive from their ungodly friends. Their ungodly friends call them and they take the advice. As a matter of fact, there are some believers who are so careless that as soon as they run into a problem, the first person they call is not a spiritual person, is an ungodly person they call to seek advice. They hear Listen to this. They hear advice about their problem and they find themselves agreeing or disagreeing without considering is this godly or ungodly counsel. And I'm going to show you how we tend to get into problems and we tend to fail sometimes when we do take ungodly counsel. Now, you might think that a godly, ungodly counsel can only come from outside, but that is not true. The counsel of the ungodly can come from one own self. Our conscience, our minds, our hearts can give us ungodly counsel. It can happen. So we can tell ourselves today that we can give ourselves ungodly counsel. Let me show you how that happened. Sometimes you want God to answer you in the affirmative when it is negative. And then we want God to answer us in the negative when it's affirmative. And that is how sometimes we do. We tell ourselves, this must be right. That is ungodly counsel. And then we have persons who we surround ourselves with. Some of them are not married, but they're giving us counseling when it comes to marriage. Some of us some of them are not living no kind of life whatsoever. But these are the very people that we turn to for advice when things in our lives as Christians are not going the way it's supposed to be. Now, what counsel can that ungodly man give to me, a godly person? Way out of whack. And too many times that is what is happening. We find people doing this and at the end of the day, Instead of doing the Christian thing, 
or the right thing. Guess what we ended up doing? The wrong thing because we received ungodly counsel. He says, who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Now, there is a scripture, 2 Samuel 6, verse 20, going all the way down to, I think, 24. And what we see in this scripture is that Ahitophel gave Absalom, David's son, the prince at that time, or one of the princes at that time, some, some counsel that was pretty, pretty bad. Absalom did not even check into that, that, that um, advice or counsel, but Absalom went and did exactly what Ahitophel said to him. And what Ahitophel said to him, hey, listen, go and lie with your father's concubine in the open. And without even thinking, Absalom went and do that. And that's ungodly counsel. He actually did it. That counsel, Absalom should not have taken from Ahitophel. This is very important for us to understand, especially when it comes to marriage. You have some unsaved friends who are married, and they don't care to hoot about their wives or husband, and what they do, hey, they will tell you, as soon as your wife starts doing something that you're not pleased with, hey, get the relationship and get another one. I mean, is, that, is that really godly advice? We need to very be very careful of what we listen to, from whom we listen to them to, even counselors. The, the believer should try his endeavor best to go to Christian counselors. Not just any counselor, but Christian counselors, so that when they are being counseled, they're counseled based on what the Bible teaches, which is our manual for life. Also, we have some friends, ungodly friends, who the Bible tells us that we ought not to render evil for evil. But some of our ungodly friends will tell us, listen, hey, she did you that, or he did you that? Go and get even. Make it right by doing evil. How can evil and evil produce good? We are to do the opposite. When people do us bad, the Bible says that we are to open ourselves and do good unto them. That is evil counsel. Too many Christians are falling because they're taking advice from the wrong people. The other thing too, it's the reason for doing things. Sometimes people tell you, hey, do it this way because if it is done this way, it will look right. Let me tell you something. Whenever you as a child of God is doing anything, don't take any counsel from an ungodly person. Because anytime you take counsel from them and that's the reason why you're doing it and it's not from your heart, whatever you're doing will not come to fruition. It will not be fruitful. And that's why the Bible says, or David in Psalm 1 says that we must not accept counsel from the ungodly. Listen, God's word is always the best counselor. And godly counselors will always bring the truth of God's word to help someone who wants counseling. We need to stop, think, and ask ourselves this question. Can people outside of Christian give counsel? Yes. But what about when it comes to godly thing? Can that unsaved person give you godly counseling? The answer is no. If they do, it's very limited. We need to pay attention to that. Now the Bible says, now stand in the path of sinners. And we need to pay attention to this. Sinners have a part where they stand, and the righteous man knows he does not belong on that part. Sinners have a part that they stand, and the righteous man knows without the shadow of a doubt that there is a part that he does not belong. The part speaks of a way, a road, a direction, and the righteous man 
is not traveling in the same direction as a sinner. We have to be cognizant of this fact. We cannot have our ungodly friends telling us, let's go to parties, let's go to discos, let's go to functions that we know we ought not to be on. The part, it says, nor stand in the part of sinners, because this is what it simply means now. When it says not stand in the path of sinners, what it actually means is to go where they go, is to be doing what they do, is to, to join them in whatever they're doing, whether it's bad or good. You know, as I looked at this and I looked at what the Bible is saying, I'm going to show you that what David prays here in Psalm 1 verse 1 is a, it's a progression or uh, retrogression. It's a, it's a fall in a way. And I'm going to show you why I say that. But let's, let's just continue to look at not standing the path of sinners. The righteous can have confidence of Psalm 16 verse 11. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness and joy. In God's presence there is fullness and joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. God has a path, and it is a good road for us to take. Always remember this. There is no need for us to want to go back. Now it says, nor sit us in the seat of the scornful. The scornful speaks of those persons who like to sit and criticize the people of God and the things of God. The righteous man will not sit in that seat. The righteous man will not criticize himself in the sense of speaking against what he knows is right. And that's why the Bible says, nor sit us in the seat of the scornful. There are some believers, when you look at them <laughs> and you see them where they're sitting, you, you wonder, really, is he, is she, are they truly born again? They criticize Christians and they're supposed to be Christians. They do stuff that the people in the world are doing, and then they condemn the church if the church speaks out against what is wrong, that is not the path of a blessed man. And this is what David is saying. And when we look at this, this is actually what came out to me. If we follow the path, notice this leads downward. The path that David speaks of in, in, in verse one, it leads downward. First, you accept counsel from the ungodly. Once you accept that counsel from the ungodly, the next thing that you're going to do is to stand in the path of sinners or before them so that they can guide you. And most times, when they start guiding you, you're beginning to go backwards. And then, it, it watch this, you can reach the place in your retrogression that you begin to sit and criticize the people of God. Don't you ever dare allow yourself to reach there. It is a part that we should never allow ourselves to reach. We should not take counsel from the ungodly. We should not stand in the path, be where they are, and always want to be associated with them. And we should not sit with them and allow them to continue to criticize God and to criticize godly people. And we ourselves join them in that criticism. It says... In Psalm um, 1 and, and verse 2, it tells us what the righteous man does. And that is important for us to remember. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditate day and night. So the first three things that we look at is what the blessed man does not do. He does not take counsel from the ungodly. He does not stand in the way of sinners, or he does not sit in the seat of the scornful. But what does the blessed man do? What does he enjoy doing? Is there something that he likes? What does the blessed man enjoy? What is it that makes him tick? But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditate day and night. Let's look at his delight. His delight is in the law of the Lord. Throughout the psalm, 
The phrase, the law of the Lord, is used to describe God's word in its entirety, not just a portion. The righteous man is delighted with the word of God. And I want to show you where this delight comes from. You will know whether you're delighting in God's word or not. You want to know why? Some Christians, when they put down their Bibles on a Sunday, that's it until the next Sunday or the other Sunday when they go back to church. But that man of God, that blessed man, the Bible says he delight in the law of the Lord. What does that mean? He enjoys the word of God so much. He says, if you want to know if the word of God delights you, check yourself. Does it make you happy? Does it get you excited? Reading God's word, does it make you feel happy? Does it bring release to you or relief? What gets you excited? Is there anything that actually gets you excited? And so it is important to note that when these things happen, we always must make sure that whatever the situation might be, that God's word should make us excited. When we study God's word, when we uh, look into God's word, it must make us excited. There is a good way to see what is important. And that is to see what brings joy to the spirit man and what also brings joy because you're a child of God. The righteous man finds his delight in the law of the Lord. Let me repeat that again. The righteous man finds his delight. He enjoys reading the word of God. When he reads it, it's, it's like eating pleasant food. It's like doing something that he enjoys doing, even though sometimes the word of God cuts sharp and it's quick. The man of God, the blessed man, still enjoys it. Now, man is made up in such a way that man must have some kind of delight, some supreme pleasure. His heart is never meant to be empty. It is not, if it is not filled with the best thing, it will be filled with unworthy and disappointing thing. And that's why the psalmist says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And so we have to understand this. If a person delights in something, you don't have to beg him to do it or to like it. They will do it all by themselves. You see people who doesn't study and then come and tell you, oh, I love God's word. That could never happen. You cannot love God's word and not study it. You cannot love God's word and then a whole week pass and you don't study it. Something is wrong. And so the, the blessed man, the Bible says, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. You can measure your delight for the word of God by how much you hunger for it. I hope you get that. You can measure your delight for the word of God by how much you hunger for it. And you know what it is to be hungry. And so if you are not excited by it, if you are not getting hungry for God's word, then you need to check yourself. He says, and in his law, does he meditate day and night? The righteous man ponders on the word of God, and he does not just hear it and forget it, but he thinks about it. Christians should meditate on God's word. Now, I have no problem in those persons who say, listen, you know what? Uh, I've read off the Bible in a year. Or I've read the Bible in, off in, in six months. My question is, what you read, do you understand what you did? Did, did, did you make, did, did you, what did you grasp from reading the Bible in six months or a year 
Because what we need to understand is that reading is good. Reading the Bible is good. And there is no excuse at all for us not to read the Bible. But what we need to understand, the psalmist says, and in his law does he meditate. So there is one aspect, the reading, but there's the second aspect, the meditating. And I want to show you an example from an animal, the cow. The cow eat grass, and then it goes and it lays down, bring that grass back up, and chew its cud. That is a form of like meditation. I mean, he lays down and you notice, he, he's almost like not even concerned about the rest of the world. As he lays down there, you notice he's not picking up anything in its mouth, but he's just chewing, 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 chewing. Because what it does, it brings it back up and then start to chew on the grass that it had eaten before. Let me show you how this goes spiritually. The Christian, what we do is that we read the word of God, which is a great aspect. Reading is, is a start. But the meditation in Christian meditation, the goal is to fill our minds with the word of God. It simply means that having read it, we now begin to turn over in our minds. What is this saying? How does this apply um, to me? How do I exercise this? Am I living this? Am I doing what this is saying? What is this saying to me? Because having read the word, something from the word should stick out at us, speak to us, tells us about ourselves or how we're treating others. This can be done, how, how, do we, how do we meditate? This can be done by carefully thinking about each word, phrase, and applying it to ourselves. That is how you meditate. People, people say, oh, you know what? I study the word. Ask them, okay, so where did you study? What did you get? And they will give you a whole chapter and they can only give you about a minute of what they got from a chapter. How could you study a whole chapter and can only give me a minute of what you got from the chapter? But that's what happened when people read. There's a difference again, let me make this clear, between reading and meditating. Meditating takes time because what you're doing, you're going over the word and sometimes what you do, you do it by word because you want to know what is this, what is, what does this one word mean? You go through it by phrase, what does this mean? And then you go through it line by line, precept by precept until you get what it is saying. What belongs to you from a scripture, you take it, you apply it. What does not belong, you leave it. Because there are some scriptures that does not necessarily apply to us as believers today. It's for back then. But we need to understand that every time we pick up the Bible and read it, we should get something from it. Many like this because they only read and they do not meditate. It is not only reading that does us good, but the soul feeding on it, digesting it day and night. This is what the psalmist says, that the soul must feed on it, must digest on it, and it must be done day and night. Now, let me hasten to say this before I move on, because a lot of people need to know this. When the Bible talks about meditate, you don't have to study a chapter in a day. You can take one verse, you work on it in the morning, and if you work, sometimes it comes back to your mind on the job. And in the night, you can use the same verse, because sometimes there's some verses that have so much meat in it. And the psalmist is saying, the blessed man meditate on God's word day and night. It brings the light. 
it brings direction it brings guidance and this is why it is important that we recognize that those of us who are blessed these are the characteristics of a blessed man not the man that have plenty money because the man that have a lot he might not know anything at all about God and that's why from the very onset I said stop thinking of a person being blessed because he has a lot of material stuff because that is wrong it's erroneous you are blessed when your sins are forgiven. You are blessed when your sins are covered. You are blessed when your iniquities are not imputed to you. You are blessed when in your heart there is no guile. You are blessed when you no longer walk within the counsel of the ungodly. You are blessed when you no longer stand in the way of sinners. You are blessed when you no longer sit in the seat of the scornful. But let's look at what happened to the blessed man. So he meditates on God's word day and night. Notice, first part, the things that he does not do. The second part, the things that he does. The third part, look what happened when he does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, when he meditates on God's word. Look at what verse 3 says. When he meditates on God's word, verse 3 says, And he shall be like a tree planted by river of waters that bring it forth fruit in its season it's his leaves also shall not wither but whatsoever he do it shall prosper do you do you do you notice this the progression watch this he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters that bringeth forth fruit in its season, whose leaves are not without, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. A tree by a river has a continuous source of water, and plants need water. We need the Spirit of God to guide us as we read his word. It will never wither away because it is always getting what it needs. Physically, a tree planted by water is in a good place, my friend. Because it's already in the earth and what it needs to help it grow is water. Now, how does this apply to our spiritual lives as I get closer to closing out this message today? What we need to understand when we are planted in Jesus, the source, the spiritual source, our leaves, what he says, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, which simply mean that we as God's children are like trees planted by rivers of water. It simply means that God continues to pour into us, pour into us, pour into us. And what does that do? What does that do to us? This would also be a tree that is strong and stable. If we are planted in Christ, we will be strong, we will be stable. Our root will sink deep and guess what happened? If our roots sink deep, then we become strong and we become stable. We receive strength and there is stability. David is saying that the blessed man is like a tree planted by the rivers of waters. He becomes strong and he becomes stable because of where he is planted. L listen to what the other thing he says that bringeth forth its fruit in its season. Now, some people want to grow up overnight. They want to do things and then overnight, all of a sudden they come like the great pastors and they don't realize that, listen, even in the Christian faith, it's a stepping stone. It's a process. You grow into God. You develop into God. You don't just arrive overnight. 
you have to grow into. You have to allow the word of God to take you to where it's supposed to go. You notice what it says. Bring it forth fruit in its season. The righteous man bear fruit such as the fruit of the spirit, but in God's time. God's time is the season. Please remember this. Hey, listen. Yes, God has already blessed all of us as his children. But guess what happened? God's blessing has spin-offs. Let me show you a typical example. And let me do this quickly. Abraham, when God wanted to test Abraham, he says, Abraham, give me your only son. Abraham was willing to take his son up and offer up his son as a sacrifice. And God says, listen, Abraham, because you did not hold this thing back from me, you know, I'm going to bless you so much that I'm going to bless you more than the sand of the sea. Now you count the sand of the sea. You count them. And God says, listen, because you were willing to do this, I'm going to bless you. Now, Abraham received his blessing because God pronounced it. Let me make this clear also. Usually when it comes to God, a blessing is what God pronounced over you. When God pronounced it over you, then it becomes a reality. So blessing is basically like a pronouncement made by God over your life. Once God pronounced that, no man, no woman can change it. When he told Abraham, Abraham, you will be blessed. But then, pastor, wasn't Abraham rich? Yes, but you know why? Because God blessed him. The physical stuff that Abraham have had were spin off as a result of God blessing him. Let me show you how that works. When God blesses us and he speaks well over us, he also makes provision for us to receive earthly things. And I'm going to show you that as I, as I close out this uh, today. Let me continue. The fruit comes naturally from this tree because it is planted by the rivers of waters. Notice what you see coming out of us. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. What you see coming out of us is always important for us to note because what comes out of us is not really from us but what God has placed in us. We don't naturally have the fruit of the Spirit. What we have is our selfish ambition, our selfish pride, and our own behaviors. God is the one who placed these things in us, and so it comes forth in its season. In abiding in a life source, as Jesus spoke of bearing fruit in John 15, 4, watch this. And this is when he talks about our, seed, our food coming forth in its season, we being planted uh, by rivers of water. Let's look at what it says. As we abide in him, John 15, 5, fruit also has a season. Some get discouraged when they begin to walk as a righteous man, and fruit is not immediately evident. But this is not so. We can only bear fruit once we remain in the vine. There are no barren trees in God's garden. So if you see a person not bearing, something is wrong. Or it's probably not the season as yet. But if he doesn't or she doesn't bear at all, then there's an opportunity for you to begin to ask questions. Because how could you be a tree planted by waters and, hey, for whatever reason you're not bearing? He says... His leaves also shall not wither. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to show me a, a tree that is planted by, by rivers of water and the trees, the leaves are brown. Except the tree has already died or died because of some other reason. And it says, brown dead withered leaves are signs of death and dryness. The righteous man does not have these signs of death and dryness. His leaves are green and are alive. Usually a person who is truly born again. Yes, you might see some selfishness come out in us at some times. We will do things sometimes that you know we are operating in the flesh. But the true man and woman of God 
the blessed man, that righteous man who stands in God's presence, usually what you will see is righteous fruit. You will see fruit bearing that ties into who he or she say they are. The blessed man, the characteristic of the blessed man. Now, the Bible went on to say, and then again, these are the fruits of the righteous man. It says, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Wow. Isn't that the righteous man? Is it that the righteous man have an, a mind as touch? So everything he does, touch, prosper, touch, it prosper. Touch. No, 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 no. Is it that everything he touches make him rich? uncomfortable no 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 because remember what i said this blessedness here that we're looking at speaks of happiness and contentment not necessarily riches i want to repeat that so people don't say pastor say that uh, the man that is rich is blessed because not because he's rich necessarily mean he's blessed so i wanted to reiterate that this morning but let's look at it in the life of the righteous man, God brings forth something good and wonderful out of everything. You, you, you realize that? I will show you a typical example. I want to show you something in John 5, John 15, 5, sorry. And then I want to show you something first from Genesis chapter 3 or Genesis chapter 39, verse 3. And let's look at this and see what happened. In Genesis chapter 39 and verse 3, this speaks of Joseph. And it's amazing that Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. Now, that is really bad, moving from a free man to slavery. But notice what David says in Psalm chapter 1 and verse 3. The latter part of verse 3 says, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And I want you to look at verse 3 of Genesis 39 and see if that is not the case. And listen to what it says, Genesis 39, 3. The master saw the Lord was with him. That is Joseph. Potiphar's, Potiphar observed, hey, the Lord was with this young man. And the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. You notice an ungodly man who bought a man and turn him into a slave, recognize that, hey, God is with that man, and everything that he put his hands to, it prospered. That is truly a blessed man. Notice, uh, Joseph did not have much. He came just with the clothes he had on. But this man noticed that everything that this guy put his hand to, it prospered even the circumstances bring forth something that that is difficult god will use that to turn it into something good sometimes we hear people say god turning our mess into messages i can tell you god turning my mess into messages and there are many of you out there who can say the same thing you can say hey you know what i was so bad i used to do this this used to happen but god took me up and turn me around and today look at who I am. That is God taking your mess and turn it into a message. And so when we look at Joseph here, God took Joseph's mess, the mess that his brothers placed him in, and turn it into a message that even the unsaved man who had in abundance, watch this. It was when Joseph went there and started to work for Potiphar, that you notice Potiphar's stuff begins to expand. Notice Joseph went with nothing, but everything he put his hand to, it was blessed. And so he prospered. Notice the blessing came from God. It came through Joseph. And we saw the benefit in what Potiphar's, Potiphar owned. So please remember that. Also in John 15, as I close out, 5, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever lives in me and I in him bears much fruit or abundant fruit. However, apart from me, 
if you're cut off from me, you can do nothing. I want to say this to you today. If you're not in Christ, you're not blessed. And I'm not going to take it back because Christ is the blesser. We receive the blessings. Can I say that again? In the context in which Psalm 1 is used and Psalm 32 is used, if you are not in Christ, you are not truly blessed. You might be prospering, but not blessed. Because there's a difference between prosperity and blessing. So don't mix them up. You, this morning, can be blessed if you give Jesus Christ a chance in your life. Hey, you might be telling me this morning, hey, pastor, you don't know who I am. You don't know how messed up I am. You don't know all that I have been through. Let me tell you this. I don't need to know. Jesus knows everything about you. He knows the mess you've been into, how many times you might have been arrested, how many times you tried to get yourself off of drugs, how many times you tried to get yourself off of alcohol. But I can tell you this morning, if you give Jesus the opportunity to take control of your life, what a difference that would make. How much difference that would make if you simply allow that. Watch this. Joseph went down to Egypt with all he had was the clothes on his back. And he turned around and became the governor or the person who is second to the king. I want to say this to you this morning. Do not let people fool you into thinking that, listen, if you have a lot of earthly possession, you're blessed. I want to leave this with you. It's only if you have Jesus Christ in your life, you're truly blessed. Please don't forget this. The only how you can bring forth fruit in this season, the only how your leaves will not wither, and whatsoever you do will prosper, is if you have Jesus Christ in your life today. May God bless you, and may you continue, those of us who are born again, look to Christ for counsel. And for those of you who are not saved, today can be the day when you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. Just ask him to come into your life. Whatever you're doing, just drop it and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me from all my unrighteousness. Become the Lord and master of my life today, I pray in Jesus' name. If you sincerely said that today, you are born again. God bless you. Thank you for listening to Focusing on God's Word with Pastor Everton Jeffers, a Bible-based study revealing the Word of God. You can follow Pastor Jeffers on God's First Radio at 102.9 FM from 1 p.m. each Sunday or on Abundant Life Radio at 103.9 FM. You can also follow him on Facebook or the YouTube channel. Thank you once again for listening to Focusing on God's Word. May God continue to bless you.